Jennifer uh, or Astrid uh, from the gender-based violence uh, area of responsibility. After the introductory remarks, uh, which will be short, uh, Ivan will run us through uh, the agenda uh, of the meeting, uh, where we will have uh, a number of substantive discussions. Uh, at the end of the meeting, uh, we will have uh, our colleague uh, Bruno uh, from the Mine Action area of uh, responsibility, uh, as well as Jim from the Housing, Land and Property uh, that will do the closing remarks. I'm getting instant messages that there has been a reshuffling. Uh, it seems that Bruno will do uh, introductory uh, messages uh, instead of uh, Jennifer. And then uh, at the end, uh, Housing, Land and Property and GBV will be uh, the ones closing down. Uh, thanks a lot, Julia, for, for these instant messages. And apologies, Bruno. It seems I've got uh, the order wrong. So We are always happy to be led by you. You're the <laughs> boss. Thank you very much. Whatever you ask me to do, I will do. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Bruno. Um, so today, uh, the purpose of today's webinar is really to first ensure we have a common understanding of the key elements and approaches for the 2021 HPC. Uh, we want to present and discuss key elements and proposed approach for the intersectoral part, as well as the sectoral part. And based on the feedback and the discussion, we will finalize the global guidance that will be shared with you as last year uh, in writing. Uh, uh, differently from last year, the guidance that will go out this year will be going out uh, clearly from us uh, as AORs and GPC, but also from OCHA to ensure that there is alignment uh, of interpretation uh, at the field level. Uh, and also today, we would like to outline the support and resources that will be available to you from the global team to support. You might remember uh, that last year we had uh, uh, done a collective AORs and GPC uh, support for operations, basically uh, to, to ensure we're able to cover all operations, as well to uh, as a signal and sign of the, the harmonized approach we have now uh, established for over a year uh, in the cluster, including the AORs. But let me zoom out uh, a bit uh, and uh, highlight five key things uh, for, for today. First, uh, the protection component uh, of the HPC um, seems to be interesting uh, when uh, we look at uh, the fact that we need our sectoral uh, part, we need our intersectoral part, and it has been evolving over the last few years. What we're advocating for, for this year, as I've said, in many of the regional calls, is a simplified uh, HPC process, uh, considering that this year uh, is challenging. And uh, we have the revision of last year's uh, HNO and HRP. Uh, we have the GHRP for COVID. Many of you are doing uh, additional appeals, and we have the planning cycle for next year. So we're really trying to uh, we tried and we succeeded to have a simplified GF guidance that will be going out, uh, I believe, this week. Um, and we're really pushing that there are no major changes uh, that are introduced in this year process. Uh, so we use uh, similar uh, starting points like last year. For example, no changes in costing methodologies, etc. Uh, I can see, I can hear that someone is... Uh, is unmuted. I would ask uh, maybe Ivan to monitor who that is and, and tackle it to ensure that uh, the sound is good. So that's the first message. The second message is that uh, we want that the analysis of protection risks, violations, and harm to be jointly done across AORs, but also with other sectors. And we can see definitely with health, uh, with food security, uh, with WASH, uh, a clear linkages dimension that we're seeing this year. Uh, but we want to, to ensure that uh, 
one, this is done. And two, in the narrative, beyond the numbers, we get stuck uh, often in the pin and the uh, figures, and that's very important. But in the narrative, it should appear as really uh, clearly established in the crises that you have where protection is central, that the central part of the problem and the analysis is, is regarding uh, protection. Uh, so we have worked within the, the, this GIAG to ensure that the analysis of protection risks, the threats and the vulnerabilities are key in the GF and HNO methodology that will go out, as I said, this week. But particularly to define the scope of the humanitarian crisis and response, priority affected geographical areas, which is very important for our overall trend to go for area based approaches, as well as populations groups, which is crucial uh, for our sector, for our cluster. Of course, we have uh, uh, children related issues that are established within an AOR. But of course, within the COVID, we've seen that issues related to, to women, to elderly people, to youth beyond the, the child age, uh, and to persons with disability uh, are uh, uh, the, the current context of, uh, of protection issues, conflict, and COVID are creating specific needs or exacerbating specific needs for these specific groups, and as such, we want that to be established. The third point, and probably that's uh, uh, a most important one. Uh, as it stands today, protection in general represents around 8% of the overall asks in the HRP for last year, on average. Out of these 8%, as it stands today, 8% or 9% are funded. So we are, as a result of this whole HPC process, we are underrepresented and we are underfunded within this underrepresentation. And this is not acceptable. We are, I would say, in a funding crisis when it comes to protection. And our choice for this year is not to disengage because this process is not productive for us. I think we want to give it serious attempt to push the process for this year to lead into a quantum leap of better representation and better funding for next year humanitarian program cycle. And when I say 8% uh, of the general HRPs is for protection, the situation becomes even more dire when you look from a child protection angle or from a GBV angle or mine action or HLP. Or, and these I would argue are the lucky one, the lucky, lucky type of protection challenges because they have an established and productive AORs. Things like Elderly, uh, elderly people, disability, trafficking, to name a few, are even more underrepresented and underfunded. So we have a big task ahead of us. And to do that, we want you to be very uh, present in the HPC cycle, in the HRP. And what we're doing is we're really pushing hard with international, at the international arena with the donors to focus on protection this year. And in December, as part of our Global Protection Forum, we will have uh, at the back of the launch of the GHO, we will have a senior high level panel where we will bring together all the sectoral chapters of the HRPs across the world and really challenge the donors uh, to really fund all of them. And I want to propose today three targets uh, to you, and they're not established uh, in a scientific way as we speak. I'm putting them forward as an indicative way that warrants a better study and a better approach from our side. But for now, where I want us to think is protection, including all the AORs, 
uh, should at least be between 15 to 20 percent of the overall HRP size. We would like also to see that at least 50 percent in all operations of our asks is met next year. And we will be by your side to push in this direction. But in addition, we want to see other sectors um, creatively uh, and intentionally uh, putting a chunk of about 5% of their asks, and it could be more for some sectors, to be supportive of protection related issue or for mainstreaming protection within their programs. So we really want to have a major push there and we're counting on a very good quality of the HRPs and the HNOs for this year to have a one last punch uh, before changing tactics uh, uh, around this issue. My fourth point um, is that we should definitely, and um, I want we, we should finish with the issue of reinforcing our efforts to ensure uh, inclusivity and people-centered HNOs and HRPs. Uh, enhanced efforts to ensure the inclusivity through disaggregated analysis and differential impacts of the crisis on diverse groups should be there. No question. We count on you to push for that. And enhanced efforts to consider priorities of affected population to inform the analysis and response through better communication and engagement with communities, especially in the inaccessible uh, parts that you're dealing with, especially uh, uh, through the reality that COVID is putting on the place, engagement and communication with communities uh, becomes uh, uh, our major uh, protection uh, channel, uh, protection response channel, and as such should be throughout the project cycle. Uh, and many of you have done uh, so well on that in the past, we need to keep pushing in this direction. And finally, that's another area where we need to get it done and over with. All HPCs, HNOs and HRPs should aim to systematically include an AOR specific section in the protection cluster chapter, as well a specific address within the HRP. It has to, we have to meet 100% in all our operations. And we're counting on you on that. And I want to push the challenge a bit further. In addition to the AOR's strong representation, as we have strong machineries to feed the analysis and do that, there is there are other types of protection challenges that I would like to responsibilize all of you, AORs and protection clusters, to focus on and make sure they're visible in your analysis in the protection cluster chapters, but also at the interagency level. Protection of civilians, anti-trafficking, mental health and psychosocial support, protection of older persons and persons with disability. Uh, these areas should be our collective responsibility to ensure the visibility of these challenges across our protection chapters, again, and the intersectoral chapter. And with this, I want you to always uh, keep in mind, there will be challenges again this year. Whenever it becomes too heated, remember that developing that plan is not the only job we have. That's only a planning thing. And sometimes letting go uh, of some stuff could be uh, uh, the right option. What's most important, is that as a result of this process, the relationship and collaboration for the response between us, AORs and PC, as well as the clusters that we work closest to become strengthened and not uh, shaken uh, by a lot of bad feelings. If I can uh, put it in a, in, a, in a very simple way, the HPC should have a good aftertaste uh, and would be great uh, if we can hear from you how we can get that done. I close here 
Uh, and I want to uh, hand over to uh, uh, to Bruno, uh, who has a couple of messages. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, things are changing so rapidly in this world. The next person is Michael, under your leadership. It's Michael's turn. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Bruno. Thanks, Bruno. Thanks, uh, William. Just checking that you can hear me. Loud and clear. Go ahead. Mark. Great. Thank, thanks, William, and thanks for, for the introduction. I'm going to be brief because we've got uh, a lot to cover. So just to start uh, with a couple of comments on, on what William um, has mentioned um, and, and to give it maybe some um, to give some examples. The first one is around priorities uh, for affected populations and how we work with those populations in defining not just what the needs are, but the response. Um, so that's about participation in, in action. And many of you are involved in the discussions around accountability to affect a population. So thinking about this year and what that means, um, particularly in terms of remote participation for, for places where that direct participation is challenging because of because of COVID, but also thinking about the design and the implementation and working with communities. And we know there's so many good practices out there. Um, and we'll talk about field support later on, but uh, collecting those good practices and sharing them, um, but also guidance around that participation, um, something uh, that we're all working on uh, and, and we'll support you, uh, support you with. Also, in terms of that joint analysis that, that William talked about, joint and integrated analysis, within the protection cluster, we've got lots of good examples, for example, between mine action and child protection, or we're working with education, mine action and child protection, work that's happening across GBV and, and, and child protection. And also, William mentioned food security, and I wanted to stress that uh, for this year um, there's a lot of emphasis on, on food security which on the one hand is understandable but on the other hand there's a risk that uh, we will uh, overlook protection or that we'll go backwards to a situation where protection is not central but seen as secondary so i think in terms of improving the profile of protection and in doing so uh, mobilizing resources all of those links, for example, around coping strategies, forced and early child marriage, for example, um, having that analysis and doing that together uh, with those other other sectors. William also mentioned uh, health and so on. I think that's going to be critical. It's always critical, but very critical this this year that we're able uh, to demonstrate that we can we can do that integrated uh, analysis. Um, William talked briefly about space and specificity for, for the AORs, and we've we've come in at around 70 to 75 percent. We need to be at 100 percent. We're working with OCHA, and we will share messaging uh, with you that you can also use at country level, uh, not just around the specificity, but also the tracking uh, within the response planning module and project modules. Uh, for FTS. And this is really important because it allows disaggregation of the reporting and tracking. And that's important, particularly for the AORs and their accountability um, to those uh, cluster lead agencies and to donors as well. It's very important. We know previously we've had to work sometimes country by country with OCHA on that. And we hope that some of this messaging um, will help to get us more consistency across across the different settings. Also, just so you know, we're working closely with OCHA uh, to make sure that we've got systematic, harmonized approaches around the HPC uh, tools. That was a challenge last year, we know, and we heard your feedback. Again, we're gonna hear about field support and collectively how we're ready to step in and, and support you with that, but also other, other issues. In terms of the sign off for the projects, also just to reference that this is important in the RPM that we have the AORs signing off. This is this is critical again uh, for their for their accountability. Um, 
I've talked a, a bit about integrated and multi-sectoral uh, responses. Um, the, the material that's going to be presented to you and a huge thanks to Ivan from the Protection Cluster who's worked with all of the AORs so effectively so that we've got a coherent uh, approach where there's really an emphasis on working with other, other sectors um, to demonstrate uh, protection protection issues. I think that's going to be, I think that's really important and, and will help us in our efforts around centrality of, of protection. Donors, uh, again, we need to do better in terms of our funding situation, but I wanted to highlight uh, something not just around the amount of funding that we're receiving, but the amount of funding that we're asking for. And I know at least for child protection, there's been uh, conversations and analysis to try and better understand the framing of the ask and the extent to which that is being preconditioned by donor expectations or indeed agency expectations. Because the risk is if we're under asking that very, very small amount uh, we're receiving will look even larger if it's not a needs based ask taking into account perhaps limitations around access, but we need to emphasize uh, the needs-based uh, ask. So again, we're there to support you on that and to help advocate with you and with donors so that we're not under asking. Uh, it's, one of, it's one of the greatest, uh, greatest risks we have. There's advocacy also at the global level, uh, as, as William uh, mentioned, and the best advocacy is based on field experience. So again, um, do be in contact uh, with us. Um, I'm going to turn back to Bruno and, and William. Um, thanks again for joining us, uh, everyone. Um, back to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Michael. Uh, message is loud and clear. Over to you, Bruno. Uh, I think we might have a sound issue with Bruno. Can you hear me? Over to you. If not, then let me hand over to you, Ivan, to run us through the agenda, uh, and then we catch up with Bruno uh, towards the end. Ivan. Sure, thanks, William. Uh, can you just check in if you can hear me well? Loud and clear, please proceed. Excellent, thanks. Um, so, well, first of all, um, hello, everyone. Many thanks for um, for joining today. Um, hope to have a, a good uh, discussion with you and hear also from your experiences, challenges, recommendations as we are into the final steps um, of finalizing guidance, but also to start planning the, the support uh, required for the HPC season. Um, thanks particularly to colleagues in, in the Americas that are joining. I know it's a, it's a bit late for, for you. Um, so quickly on the agenda, I mean, after this uh, initial introduction and key messages um, from, uh, from the global coordinators, um, we'll go to quickly go through the key elements um, of the HPC uh, process, particularly uh, regarding HNOs, HRPs, some of the key expected changes for this year, and then some key recommendations we we want to, to share with you uh, on um, for this year, based on also the review, lessons learned, uh, but also trying to address some of the challenges we know you experienced uh, during last uh, season. Um, so hopefully this will uh, be uh, with uh, 20 minutes or so, um, and then we want to open for a for a discussion um, and feedback from from your side, from all the different operations. Uh, we will have a small break. Um, um, hope is please don't disconnect. Uh, continue connected, uh, just to yeah recharge energies. Uh, so that will be I think around 4:15, 4:20 that we will have it, and then we'll. Uh, the last session will focus more on, on the HNO guidance, the expected uh, plan changes to the intersectoral and sectoral analysis 
um, and uh, some key recommendations uh, from our side. Um, and again, we'll have um, an opportunity to hear feedback from you. And yeah, finish just so with some closing uh, wrap up um, and next steps regarding the yeah, expected guidance um, and, uh, and support from the global level for this season. So without further delay, let me start uh, with the SPC process. Um, so Last season, we had over 28 countries with uh, HNOs so, of uh, among all the operations where um, yeah, cluster sectors or, or working groups is active. This included through um, three late additions, the, the Central American countries that um, produce uh, an HNO just recently, and 25 of them, so uh, except the, um, the countries uh, in Central America um, had an HRP. Um, three are not uh, yet published, but um, um, most uh, are already reflected in the, in the were in reflecting the global humanitarian overview. Uh, overall, we're talking about 96 million people in need of protection, which is compared to the total people in need of protection in those operations is close to 70 percent. And of that, we are targeting yeah, roughly half of a, a bit more than half of those. And as uh, William was mentioning, uh, well, the original requirements uh, for before COVID were around 1.7 billion. And now, uh, after the uh, revisions to HRP or uh, specific addendums, 2 billion uh, in protection requirements. From uh, key highlights from uh, from uh, yeah uh, the review and the conversations and the yeah, uh, exchanges we've been having with with you, but also revisions uh, of the documents at the global level, uh, protection concerns were uh, and the analysis of it was systematically featured in the intersectoral narrative. Uh, as we will see, there is a discussion about the the consequences and the protection pillar, but in the narrative, which is also particularly important for protection, was, was systematically included. And um, as you might be aware, uh, every year there is an independent scoring process of HNOs and HRPs, and this was actually one of the elements that was um, the score the high, um, the highest in, in this um, process that was conducted by yeah, donors and some key agencies. Um, we also saw that yeah, the, the protection analysis in sector chapters was um, yeah, was also solid and including uh, in the majority of cases, not all, um, AOR specific sections, narrative analysis uh, and figures, both in the HNOs and the HRPs. Um, however, not yet in all of them. So I think as uh, Michael was saying, this is one uh, and William, this is one of the of the areas that we want to yeah to uh, keep working and, and recommending that for for this season we ensure that all um hnos and hrps include these specific sessions enhance also disaggregated analysis and figures uh, by um, sex gender age uh, and disability cross-cutting also as as is now mandatory in most of the hnos in the HRPs, this analysis is a bit more limited, um, but uh, yeah, it was cross-cutting across uh, both the intersectoral and the sectoral uh, specific analysis. Um, again, as mentioned, the majority of HRPs included the specific sections and requirements for the areas of responsibilities uh, and included priorities, but again, not all. And um, we also saw an increased reference within the HRPs to integrated programming, as the examples that Michael was, was saying. And, and we also think, uh, I mean, based also on, um, on the season la and the support last year, I think there was a, a good approach in a collaboration communication between the um, national clusters and AORs with the global team, with the GPC AORs. Uh, particularly on yeah, during the season of needs uh, analysis of, of HNOs, um, uh, but also across throughout the year. But um, I think this is also one of the key messages lessons for for this year that yeah we hope to be providing um, this um, continuous communication and support to you throughout the whole um, cycle. But obviously, we also saw some um, some. Con 
let's say challenges um, starting with yeah obviously the new approach uh, for severity and its analysis both for intersectoral and sectoral um, is dependent also uh, on um, data availability which um, yeah for protection we still need to reinforce uh, and mainstream and harmonize um, the mixed approach, the mixed messages about the intersectoral severity analysis and pin calculations, uh, the confusing, confusing guidance um, from uh, headquarters on uh, the AC pillars, the uh, confusing guidance from OCHA on this, and also even the, the lack or delays in uh, guidance for pin calculations, but also lack of the guidance for the JAF, uh, which is something that has been um, is being addressed as priority for this year. We also saw that, yeah, for the protection chapter, we see that, um, again, majority are now including the specific sessions for, for AORs, but obviously we see challenges in the, the limited space that uh, the protection um, sector or cluster have, um, usually sometimes limited to two pages that every, everything has to fit, but I, I know some of you managed to, to advocate and, and secure, uh, uh, yeah. Um, an extended um, section. Um, the title guidelines, well, yeah, I think this is um, a recurrent obvious um, challenge um, and some challenges with the management uh, of project submissions. That is also one of the key priority areas that we hope to, to be supporting you this year. And as William and uh, Michael also were mentioning, the, the diversity in the representation or the percentage of protection funding requirements on, on the total um hrp requirements um yeah from some operations several operations below five percent to others that yeah uh, even be, beyond 20 or 30 percent so yeah as william mentioned is something to to um work for this year and finally again as michael was mentioning the different approach uh for the setup of hpc tools um i'll go a bit more in detail on that there was a um, an agreed approach last year with um, OCHA here at the headquarters level that we understand was interpreted differently by the different offices and created challenges for you. So this time we, we're hoping that uh, the message is clear and harmonized and, and this is implemented in a systematic manner. Some of the key changes, um, to be honest, the idea, as William mentioned, not only if, um, what we have been advocating, but also their global clusters and, uh, and agencies is for a simplified approach. Uh, we know that uh, there is a multiplicity of processes at the same time. Uh, this year, the challenges of COVID. So the fundamental elements of the approach and the templates will, will remain largely the same. There will be some uh, changes to simplify it or merge subsections, uh, and obviously some of the changes related to the to the approach for joint intersect analysis, which will go in the second part of the webinar. Um, this time, as again, there will be a guidance uh, on, on the joint intersectoral uh, framework. Um, it is expected and is recognized also by by uh, all partners, and I think it has been also communicated to donors, um, the availability of data, which is usually a challenge this year with COVID will be even uh, a greater challenge. So the use of secondary data uh, that is available, expert judgment will be even uh, more important. Um, and yeah, one of the main changes, not versus 2020, but with, versus the process for this year with the GHRP is that COVID-19 response or um, needs impacts that should be integrated for, for the next year, this time will be integrated uh, as the message received from 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 OCHA into the 2021 HPC. Still need to see how that exactly is uh, plays out in the in the guidance that uh, are being finalized at the global level. Um, and finally, an increased focus on risk analysis and projections, which was also one of the changes on the enhances uh, HPC approach. But this time, um, even also more relevant to to the current situation of COVID, will be. Um, a specific focus, and there is also a specific guidance being prepared to, to support operations on that. So in terms of key areas of focus, uh, I think this some uh, I will go quick because most were covered uh, by William and uh, Michael in the introductory messages. Um, but yeah, uh, and some are uh, messages that 
We were also part of the uh, guidance and, uh, and key messages we shared for, for last year that are maintained and reinforced for this year, such as the active or lead role we expect from um, protection clusters in the ORs to ensure the centrality of protection is properly reflected in the analysis, in the response prioritization, um, and hopefully the, the new guidance that, that we will explain a bit more in the second part will, will, will contribute to that. Um, the efforts, uh, continue efforts, enhance efforts to include ensure inclusivity, uh, people-centered approaches based also on uh, affected uh, population priorities and concern. As we were mentioning, the visibility of um, the specific analysis of AORs or other uh, other key areas of protection. Um, and yeah, the other ones I think we we also touch upon during the the, la the first part. The harmonized approach for HPC tools. Uh, we will go a bit more in detail about that just now. Um, the need for comprehensive um, planning approaches based on the operational footprint and the benchmarks that um, William was explaining. Um, and the focus on integrated programming. Lastly, and it will not necessarily be covered in this webinar, uh, but happy to hear also your thoughts during the discussion. We know also. We need to, to enhance and harmonize our response framework and response monitoring systems. Uh, there is an increased focus, uh, particularly now with COVID, as you probably are experiencing with, with um, tight demands on information on uh, reporting on progress of the HRPs um, and of the response plans. Um, and we know that we uh, also from the global level will need to, to provide uh, more guidance and support on that area. Here, so you don't get bored with my uh, voice the whole uh, afternoon, I will give the floor to uh, Ricardo, hope you can hear us well, who's going to quickly run on, on the importance um, and guidance for disability inclusion and in HNHRPs. Ricardo, can you confirm you can hear us? Thank you. Can you hear me, Ivan? Yes, perfect. Go, go for it. Thank you. So, um, well, hi everybody. I'm working as protection officer on disability inclusion and older age as well for UNHCR. And I would like to present briefly why it's important that we are reflecting these intersecting factors of, of risk within, within the HNO. Well, persons with disabilities first uh, deserve and should be included in protection activities as members of, of the diversity of the, of the community they are part of. Um, and recognizing as well that disability is a shared factor of identity across uh, community groups that uh, require specific protection. For example, women, uh, one in five women will will experience a disability across her, her life. Children, uh, one in ten children have a disability, and older people, uh, almost half of older people of the population, the global population of older people, uh, live with this disability. Now, these estimates are based uh, are already almost 10 years old. Is, uh, they're coming from 2011, from the WHO report on disability in 2011. And what we've seen uh, during the recent years is that the trend that was uh, discussed previously uh, is that uh, persons with disabilities or disability prevalences tends to be higher in situations of conflict and, risk and displacement. In the, in the left and right side of the, of the slides, you can see that, for example, in Syria, 27% of persons uh, of, of, of the population have a disability. Uh, this report has uh, the more nuanced data having, for example, in Aleppo, cities like Aleppo, half or more, I, I, if I remember well, more than half of the population of women have a disability. In Jordan, uh, refugees with disabilities amount to 21% of the population. And in contexts as Afghanistan, um, there are more nuanced data where we have severe disabilities that in developing contexts would be around 2 to 3% of the population, amount to 14% almost of the population, and moderate disability would be 65% of the population. And similarly, with children uh, with disabilities would be higher than only 10%, would be around 17.3%. That to say that disability is 
overrepresented in uh, conflict and displacement, but it's not only about prevalence. The, what is important is that uh, persons with disabilities or women and children with disabilities are uh, facing as well barriers to access protection and other humanitarian services. Those barriers include physical barriers to physically access those services, receive information about those services, being able to communicate and even request for support. And then there may be attitudinal barriers as well in communities, within their families, but as well in our own uh, service provision. If we can go please to the next slide, Ivan. Uh, so we have been a, as part of a, of a joint uh, UN initiative uh, with UNICEF, WHO, WFP, IOM and other uh, UN entities. We've been providing support and developing resources to ensure that HNOs and HRPs were uh, including disability and other factors of dis of discrimination within within uh, the the reports and including if I'm not wrong, from 2018. We have learned some, some lessons from these processes. And what we have seen is that, well, um, a lesson learned and a key achievement is that we start to have persons with disabilities and issues, barriers that they faced, um, differentiated from other vulnerable groups. If we see in the past, we tend to, to have a wide paragraph saying that well uh, additional protection issues were faced by and then we had a line on different protection issues this is something that has been changing and has allowed for more nuanced analysis but as well protection responses uh, the the intersectionality of of different factors as i've uh, mentioned has been uh, bringing as well uh, better detail and more rich activities that are owned by different uh, stakeholders because they identify that uh, persons with disabilities are part of their own population of concern. If they are working on GVV or if they are working on, on child protection, they start to see that women with disabilities, children with disabilities are part of, of their own populations. We've seen that is really key that the participation of persons with disabilities, engagement with organizations of persons with disabilities, of um, disability specialized organizations that are present in country has really made a difference in having an ownership, a focal point, a technical input in the analysis of data, and as well in the formulation of uh, protection responses and, and activities while keeping into account that they should not be put all the burden of solving, let's say, the situation of, that this population face. They do not have the capacity to address all these issues. It's, it's a shared responsibility as it has been shared by by our leadership in the, in the, in the introduction. But it is true that they may have the expertise that can bring a, a, a solution and a change. Data collection, as, as I have said, uh, there's starting to be more and more data collection processes. There may be dedicated surveys. There, the, the survey, for example, in Jordan was part of the vulnerability assessment framework run by UNHCR, but the other two services were dedicated uh, surveys uh, on disability, so to, to understand the prevalence in country. Those exercises can be as well complemented in monitoring efforts and um, in uh, post distribution, so for example, post distribution monitor monitoring or uh, access in registration of services, etc. Different sources can be used. And what is important is that using this global prevalence of 15% should only be used when we don't have resources or when the data in country is lower. In some countries, we see 2 3%. Uh, shared by National Statistic Office, those are not real or realistic uh, numbers, right? The, the disability tends to be underestimated. And finally, in terms of uh, solutions, well, what would be better is always counting on a twin track, having ensuring that 
protection is equally accessed by persons with disabilities, that we are working on the barriers they face. If we address communication barriers, if we address physical barriers, we will have a better um, access, not only by persons with disabilities, but by many other uh, users of our of our services and then having dedicated actions for example outreach or having sign language interpreters on call in certain uh, cases or in certain services that require sensitive translation etc so to ensure their inclusion now where we can find this information if we go into the next slide Ivan so in this uh, slide, we've summarized some of the related resources. Uh, on the first segment on the top, you can see some uh, guidance related in particular to integrating disability into HNOs and HRPs. They are all accessible online and the, and the slides will be shared. Um, there's guidance, but as well tip sheets, more, more reduce let's say uh, information bits there's a webcast that we did last year on dedicated to this to inclusion into hno hrps if you want to to have more detail uh, and walk through the process and then in terms of the response so once we have the data well, once we have collectively uh, resourced all that information we can formulate activities using the second segment we have the iac guidelines on inclusion of persons with disabilities that have been recently released last year. There are dedicated agencies guidelines. For example, UNICEF has a series of booklets. UNHCR has a need to know guidance as well on, on inclusion of persons with disabilities. So we can look as well at our agency's mandate and look at those resources. And then um, there are dedicated services as well on or resources on COVID that has been recently uh, developed. The notes on applying these guidelines, uh, so the IAC guidelines into uh, COVID response is already available, so we can share that. And that is all. I am welcome comments or questions from your side. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. Uh, for these very useful uh, recommendations and uh, resources that we will make sure to share with all. Um, I'll just go quickly to the other points, uh, just a couple more and then open for discussion. I think while well, this message was already reiterated uh, in the introduction and, and before, but yeah, one of the key areas to keep ensuring that um, this time we move from, yeah, roughly 75% or, or so of, of documents that include this a specific analysis to to all of them obviously according to to the aors that are active in in each operation but also to make sure that um we don't leave behind in in the narrative knowing that it's already a, a tight um, um extension uh for the document other key protection areas uh, but for the specific AORs, since the enhanced approach uh, allows for um, a specific session with uh, the figures uh, in the HNO, in this case, uh, pin specific figures and the HRP specific tag requirements and, and number of partners or projects. And then um, on the, the the topic we were just this, um, mentioning before, uh, and Michael touched upon this, um, we are hoping to send a, uh, working with OCHA to send a joint message to all OCHA offices and also to, to you as clusters and AOR, so everyone is clear on the up standardized approach that was agreed for last year and that will still be the um, the recommended approach for this year. Uh, when it comes to the RPM, um, we are uh, the recommendation is to have one field cluster or coordination, coordination entity that will be called protection and where we will all have um, the associated framework of, of objectives and indicators, but then that will be associated to what in the system, and this is just language that the system need to use, um, what is called global sectors, which in this case should be the, the, the exact language as, as it is included here. That we saw that some operations did follow that for last year, but in some others, um, I know we understand that um, we're receiving different replies from, from OCHA colleagues in the field. So this is the setup for RPM, and that will allow 
that in projects module, um, uh, the owners uh, of the projects can submit to that single field cluster, but then can divide the percentages uh, of the financial requirements across these um, subsectors, sub subsectors that will be activated according to each context. Um, and that will allow that uh, later, uh, both uh, in the system, but also more importantly in FTS, um, we can have um, disaggregated reporting, but also aggregated for the whole cluster, both options um, to be reporting, tracking um, the specific uh, and overall uh, requirements. Um, and the message also is that um, this should be allowed both for a project and activity-based costing. Um, and colleagues and are working on a, on a technical solution um, to ensure this. So just to finish before opening for, for questions, um, the expected uh, interagency guidance, so by mid-July, so end of next week, is expected that the HPC step-by-step -step guidance templates and timelines will be shared with the field. Um, this will be accompanied by a specific or annex guidance, one and the one that has been discussed the longest and will touch upon the second session, the joint intersectoral analysis guidance, uh, but also guidance on risk analysis and projections, on prioritization response analysis and targeting, and on monitoring. The monitoring might be delayed a bit. And uh, at the interagency level also uh, expected to have additional guidance on costing methodologies and HPC tools management. And then also develop tailored trainings um, all this obviously has been delayed because of well, the discussion on the on the main guidance, but also the, the situation uh, due to COVID. And from the GPC side, as was also mentioned from William, we'll be also sharing at the yeah, parallel or a few days uh, after the sectoral guidance for HNOs that is aligned to, to the new um, approach or to the enhanced approach for this year. And then we'll be working to develop also another specific sectoral guidance on HRP with the specific recommendations on key issues that we, I mean, these key messages that we were reiterating, but also some key specific guidance on targeting prioritization, costing and response frameworks and projects management that um, we also have heard from you that is that is um, something expected and that will be useful. And I'll uh, be organizing also additional webinars. Um, there is, uh, as you know, within the Global Protection Forum, a session of um, thematic technical webinars mostly in September, but we, we will be also discussing the, the need and the usefulness of having additional specific webinars in different um, for these different elements. And uh, obviously, start the dedicated as soon as possible or at, as at the moment, uh, remote and field support. So I'll stop here. Um, I'll um, open up for questions. Um, I know I'll very see one in the in the chat box. Um, so um, thanks, Marie Emily. But yeah, um, please feel free to raise your hand, uh, and we can coordinate um, the yeah the discussion like that. Um, but yes, um, Marie Emily, if you want to just make the question for of, um, orally, so everyone can hear you, and we kick start this this uh, this part. Hope you can yeah, hear us well. Yes, thanks, Ivan. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for all of this. Uh, it's very useful. We we had a, a meeting yesterday with the, um, the intercluster, and uh, we started the discussion on on the revision of the on the sorry on the uh, the next HRP, and they did mention uh, a recommendation. Um, not to use any more the protection consequence, and I was wondering uh, what was the GPC position uh, on that, and uh, and how we should, um, yeah, what 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 uh, position we should have, and and uh, and then what does it mean concretely um, uh, if we don't have any more the protection consequence in, in in terms of ensuring the centrality of protection in in the strategic objectives. Thank you. Thanks, very Emily. Uh, we're going to discuss that about more detail in the second session, but just um, as uh, in advance. Um, at the moment, the the discussions uh, stand as that uh, for this year, and in the sense also to simplify the approach for this year, but also to avoid uh, the confusion and complexities 
uh, of last year uh, around the discussion about the humanitarian consequences that uh, some countries uh, use only two, others three, others four, which were including, uh, uh, as you know, physical mental well-being, living standards, protection and resilience. Uh, but there was uh, mixed messages, mixed guidance uh, from OCHA and also uh, an emphasis that only living standards and a physical men mental well-being will count upon intersectoral pins. So um, the decision for now, uh, an agreement from across all the partners and global clusters, um, only to have one intersectoral pin for this year, once one figure. Uh, the pillars and sub pillars would only be to help to, to classify uh, information, but there will be only one intersectoral pin and then complemented by the sector specific pins. So this is one, one thing. So um, as we will go a bit more in detail in the second part, where we uh, consider also that protection, the central protection is bet will be better reflected because what happened last year is that we had this protection uh, pin and protection consequence that mostly we took the, the lead and ensured that it was the same as the protection pin. So it was not so much being central to all the other sectors is that protection will be uh, best uh, ensure the central protection through the context shocks and impacts analysis with a specific focus on protection risk violations that will inform the identification of priority areas and groups for all the analysis and, and response. So that's where we see and there will be a specific section on that. So more on the um, the intersectoral uh, implication of that, but also in the, on the narrative section of the HNO HRPs. That's for the HNO HRPs. For the strategic objectives, um, that will be something that, that we can also discuss. But yeah, uh, what we saw is that those strategic objectives both also address the underlying factors, main drivers of the crisis, which in many cases obviously is um, uh, associated to protection pins. So that has not been um, considered only only discussions for now or for the HNO uh, analysis. So I hope that answers your question, but maybe after in the second session we can we can dig down a bit more on that. Um, good. Um, any other uh, questions? And I'm hearing also here one suggestion that we yeah, will make sure to to do um, that. Yeah, to have these uh, webinars also in French uh, for the next opportunity. So we'll follow up on that for sure. Um, Jax, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I try my English. Uh, it's quite poor, but uh, hope you get my point. Can you hear me? Can I check that you are hearing me? Yes, we hear you. If you could uh, get closer to the mic, that would be also great. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, my point was uh, uh, related to uh, maybe the monitoring or the financial tracking. I think one of the issues we have is uh, about what is uh, called on the FTS as uh, what design as um, um, cluster, multi-cluster project. We choose to have, um, but the thing is, I felt there is uh, more money on protection uh, within multi-cluster uh, project. So uh, I think it will be better to see how uh, sensitize maybe uh, agencies or partners uh, I don't know through OCHA or which channel but to make sure we sensitize them uh, so there's a way to split those uh, project multisectorial it will help us uh, to better collect or to better monitor the uh, the instant our request is uh, responded within uh, within the HRP, um, and it will be better to to see whether they could uh, disaggregate or split this, uh, taking into account also uh, the part which is channeled to the uh, to the to AORs. Uh, I think it will it will uh, it will help us on the uh, on the monitoring uh, monitoring side.
Many thanks, Jack. So let me start answering um, that question, but also colleagues, um, yeah, other colleagues from the Upsell or ARs, feel free to to complement. This indeed has also been uh, already brought to to our attention. Um, also, yeah, from other clusters or AORs where also this, um, uh, yeah, in, in the spirit of integrated programming also um, uh, specific requirements and uh, uh, in a growing um, trend are being included um, as multi-cluster or multi-sector uh, projects um, and that will, will be important also that is, there is uh, the system allows to also track and, uh, and report and monitor those um, those um, requests. So uh, in our discussion that we are having with OCHA because of the modification of the, the system that allows to have um, this tracking by, by um, also specific requirements but for AOR, there will be uh, technically the possibility also to, to start doing that. But obviously it's not only for us, it will be um, uh, yeah, a discussion that will need to happen with all the other clusters uh, that probably will be also interested in, on that. So we are definitely going to to follow up on that with um, with OCHA because yeah, we're hearing that um, it's um, yeah, a growing uh, trend and, uh, and an interest to also start tracking these, these funds um, that um, fall in, in, in multi-sector projects. Um, but yeah, I don't know, colleagues from from the Opsel uh, or AORs, if uh, anyone wants to complement on this. No, okay. Then, Jax, I, I don't know if that answered your your question. Um, or uh, yeah, like um, or something wa from um, was me. So you will like clarification. Jax. Ah, yes, perfect. Uh, no, it's fine. It's yeah, fine. yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, great. Um. Any other questions um, um, or contributions um, or experiences or challenges you would like to share? Um, or also on the, yeah, as many Emily was uh, also sharing with us on some of the initial communication you have received about the, about the HPC and whether, yeah, something that we need to be aware or, um, yeah, follow up. Over to you, colleagues. Jax, I see also your hand raised. Uh, please go ahead if it's a second intervention. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, just uh, you know, on the uh, on the challenge side, um, I think it's a bit challenging when you are discussing within uh, the Manicap within the HCT on the on the request. Uh, I'm just uh, thinking about uh, the point. You mentioned about the uh, when uh, uh, when assessing the, the, the budget need and uh, not to under asking. Um, you know, uh, I think when we are discussing within the XCT, uh, we are actually uh, coming to support and to uh, to defend our sectoral chapters. Um, they used to have a reference. Uh, they used to refer to um, to the past years in terms of uh, how many uh, the cluster requested and how many we we got. Uh, so they used to to refer to this, you know, uh, as to say, are we uh, over asking or are we uh, asking what we could. We could uh, will be able to to spend uh, during the year, and 
to see also, you know, the, uh, the capabilities of our members. So it's a kind of, uh, of, uh, of course, with OCHA, but also within the, the HCT. Um, but the point is always well taken. We need to, uh, to be uh, needs-based and needs-oriented. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's just a, uh, a challenge we faced uh, when discussing within uh, the, humanitarian camp, the humanitarian camp team. I don't know if it's the same for other operations, but I think it will be, uh, again, a challenge, but, uh, but we will do uh, the best we can and, and refer to, uh, to you to guide us on this. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jax. Um, and yes, um, yeah, that's um, a usual um, challenge that we know happens uh, often uh, and the vicious cycle about, yeah, um, because we're not being funded at the level that, that we should uh, and even compare with other um, clusters of sectors, then there is um, a tendency to, um, yeah, either OCHA offices, HCTs to have a decision to, to keep reducing or limiting the, the ask. Uh, for the next cycle, um, which yeah, info, it will will be a vicious cycle because then you you start getting funding again for a limited portion every time. So we do um, yeah, that's something that definitely um, from the global level uh, we're happy to provide uh, support uh, and advocacy um, as needed. Um, so yeah, I think this is one of the key points also as William was highlighted. So. William, I don't know if you want to uh, complement or um, on this. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think also uh, Michael alluded into that. I think what's dangerous is that the transition from year to year in terms of the budget size is uh, is influenced by the previous year. So the moment you have designed your ask last year if the context hasn't changed a lot you're stuck in this margin for the following year so even if your partner's capacity has been built and is able to take more uh, you're still stuck uh, in some kind of a ceiling that is fake uh, is not uh, is not real is not needs based so there is a technical component to that, uh, which we encourage you to go through. In case uh, you feel it's more of an partner agencies that are not able to scale up programmatically, we encourage you to reach out to us immediately uh, so we can contact the headquarters of the different organizations and create internal pressure for these organizations to scale up uh, their capacities in case it's international organizations. In the case of national organizations, uh, you will need a strategy uh, to, uh, to build the capacity and make that known and, and build it up from year to year. So Jack, I agree with you. It's a problem almost everywhere. Uh, there is a technical as part of the planning uh, uh, component to it. Uh, go through that and push the figures to get as close as possible to the needs uh, uh, and contact us uh, if for a specific AOR or a specific uh, dimension of, of protection. We know the needs is there, but you also know that there is no partner capacity, then it's our job globally to really push and support you to, to have the right organizations uh, scale up uh, their programs. Over. Um, William, it's Michael here, if I could come in on that. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. William. Yeah, just as an example, we've seen that uh, previously, um, uh, for example, in, in DRC, where we've had locations where we did not have partners and we've been able to advocate with with donors, putting donors and partners together on a global call and to put the issue on the table and say we need uh, we need presence and also where we need uh, international partners to take a different approach and that is to support local partners to deliver services where 
there may may not be the usual kind of set up funds for an international partner so it's something yes we can we can support you with around that advocacy and also bringing attention uh, to a particular location over Well, thank you very much. It's uh, it's well not only I think we will um, for sure we will uh, we will link to you um, accordingly when uh, when processed. Uh, merci beaucoup. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks a lot um, for that. So plus uh, round uh, for uh, questions, feedbacks. Um, comments? Okay, so, well, we are um, uh, on track uh, with the agenda, so as suggested, um, let's all take, um, yeah, five or so minutes uh, break just to stretch our legs, have a cup of coffee, and um, we'll restart at 4.25. Um, um, so in yeah, seven or eight minutes uh, Geneva time. Thank you, Ivan. See you soon, colleagues. And in the meantime, if any of you have questions, or please feel free to to start adding them in the in the chat box. Thanks.
Hello again, colleagues, confirming that you can hear me well. Loud and clear. Thanks, William. OK, so. Uh, yeah, on the second session, as as mentioned, we want to focus on. Let me just go back to the on the HNO guidance, which uh, uh, would be the, the first step. And we know for some operations, even already discussion have at least started or are starting. So we wanted to bring you up to date to what are the key elements and approach that is being um, suggested uh, for the uh, 2021 cycle. Um, some of the key changes um, and, uh, and the guidance that we um, are finalizing both within um, at the intersectoral level and we're contributing, but also the, the sectoral part. Um, and particularly also hear from you uh, to clarify any questions, but also have some feedback that we um, should uh, reflect in, in both the global and the sectoral guidance. So, um, for this year, I mean last year, just as, a, as an introduction, I think you well, most of you or uh, several of you were engaged also in the in the HPC 2020 process. Um, within the enhanced approach, one of the key elements that uh, was um, strengthened or was aimed to be strengthened uh, was the joint intersectoral analysis of needs, the joint intersectoral uh, also response planning, prioritization uh, uh, with a focus also to understand um, where um, integrated or multi-cluster, multi-sector responses were more uh, needed uh, and priority. Um, and for this, the idea was to um, have as a framework um, what is called the JAF, the Joint Interse Interagency Analysis Framework, um, or Joint Intersector Analysis Framework sometimes referred to, um, which has been an initiative um, that started, yeah, most uh, more than three years ago, uh, a discussion uh, at the global level between the different global clusters, lead agencies, and, uh, and other key partners, um, and was then integrated into the grand bargain commitments on uh, improved needs assessment and uh, harmonize and joint needs assessment. Um, but by the time that the HPC 2020 was being uh, developed, the guidance, the templates, the JAF was not yet agreed um, or validated. Um, so only a few elements were integrated into the enhanced approach, um, but there was a bit of um, divergency between um, the framework that was being discussed, but in addition, there was a bit of lack of guidance. So for this year, the idea is that uh, the HNO particularly template is more aligned to the discussions and to the um, developments that have happened um, yeah, in recent months um, since the last cycle uh, on the joint intersectoral framework. Um, and on that, obviously, there has been a um, um, key question or a key concern from our side on how to ensure that um, centrality of protection is a core um, uh, and protection analysis is a central element in the joint intersectoral analysis. Um, last year, um, there was that discussion was um, not finished, uh, and we consider the the framework still was not reflected the central protection. Um, and it's concretely the framework that you see here, and that you probably have seen also in in other guidance or documentations. The framework. Um, as it is, is um, divided in four main pillars, the context, the shock, and the impact pillars, um, which, as you can see there, uh, have, um, should be the, the ones that um, establish, help to establish, well, both the contextual analysis of the humanitarian crisis, we are all responding, but also the identification of the areas affected by the specific shocks or drivers of the crisis, and uh, the people affected, um, the impact these drivers or shocks are having um, on population, uh, such as displacement or uh, um, 
impacts directly on um, on other um, enjoyment of rights, the humanitarian access impact and the impact on service systems and services, disruption services. And then those three pillars um, are also linked to what is called humanitarian conditions in the framework, what was reflected in the HPC last year as humanitarian consequences, which um, were the concrete uh, outcomes that the impact of the crisis was having on, on population. That was the basis for the uh, severity analysis of needs and the calculation of intersectoral people in need. The framework from the beginning has had these three sub pillars that you see here living uh, physical and mental well being, living standards, coping mechanisms. In last year, HPC, because the framework was not finalized, the HPC um, uh, included some elements, but also uh, some differences. Um, as you might recall, the coping mechanism pillar was called resilience, and there was also a protection pillar that was included as a um, temporary transitional solution to ensure that protection, since it was not yet properly reflected throughout the framework um, as a central element, to be uh, sure that it was visibilized uh, in a specific manner. And that was the uh, pillar that, um, in our guidance, um, uh, that was developed last year. Um, was uh, the role of protection clusters and AORs at the field level to um, um, contribute to the analysis and to the calculation behind that pillar in consultation with other clusters uh, and reflect the same sectoral severity and people in need in that pillar uh, and included in the in the intersectoral sections of the of the approach. Now, what we have seen and also um, evidence and uh, discuss with you. Um, obviously, that created quite a lot of challenges. Um, one, because from one side, um, the guidance was still giving uh, higher emphasis to the living standard and physical and mental well-being pillars to calculate uh, people in need. Um, so that's why also why our guidance also as to divide the indicators um, and analysis of the protection pillar into these other two or three pillars as, as per the context. Um, so while protection was quite visible in the cases that this pillar was used, uh, it was also not necessarily central to the to all the, to all the analysis and, and the um, uh, intersectoral uh, severity uh, and pin calculations. It was, as many other sectoral indicators, protection was also contributing to the other two pillars and was just, yeah, let's say, the same weight as any other um, of the sectors. Um, but more than that, is the, the central protection was, um, was also being left out and the whole kind of JAF uh, guidance at the moment was not very clear on how the context shocks impacts um, analysis could be uh, more linked and more used um, uh, within the framework and within the HNO. So this year, this is um, we have what we've been discussing, uh, both to address the challenges about confusion, simplify, but also to ensure a more proper integration of central protection within the framework. What we have been discussing and uh, have recommended um, and is now part of the the draft guidance that will be out uh, soon, as mentioned before, uh, after mid-July, is that um, the analysis of uh, protection, um, risk, violations, uh, harms, should be also central, uh, or should particularly be central to the analysis of the three, three first pillars of the framework. Um, as usually most uh, the drivers of the crisis are related particularly to protection violations, but also understand protection as yeah, the central protection defined it um, um, both um, in an integrated approach and an in-depth approach. And this will be particularly not only to influence the analysis, the narrative um, of yeah, what is the context we are analyzing, what are the main shocks and impacts, but concretely also to ensure that that analysis helps to ident jointly identify and jointly agree as one of the first steps of the GIAF and HNO in this case, 
um, a joint identification of what are the priority affected areas related to the humanitarian crisis and what are the affected population uh, groups and particularly not only the um, standard ones as in the humanitarian profile, but also the specific vulnerable groups um, that are having a particularly impacts of, of the crisis. So this will be will mean that more several of our indicators that um, were also having a, a problem fitting in the humanitarian conditions pillar that will be looking at the needs of the population uh, concretely will uh, fit in the context shocks impact indicator and will inform and lead that analysis in uh, also together with other key sectoral indicators that uh, we have been discussing and uh, clusters have also recommended um, obviously to, to ensure that other key drivers, key shocks and impacts of the crisis, for instance, in terms of health, but uh, very relevant for, for this year, are also part of that uh, joint process. Then uh, all the sectors will contribute uh, and protection and AORs and other key areas of protection will also contribute to the specific needs um, and proxy indicators for the humanitarian conditions analysis. But as mentioned also before, one of the key recommendations and is now reflected in the guidance is that for this year there shouldn't be calculations uh, by subpillar of people in need of severity. There should be only one combining all those different indicators um, to produce one intersectoral uh, pin and one intersectoral uh, severity uh, score. Um, within this also there has been um, quite a lot of discussions on the um, challenges for this year and the on, on data collection. Given that the framework as it was developed initially um, rely significantly on household level data. Um, the framework and the model to aggregate all those indicators to produce an average severity score per geographical area or population group um, fits better uh, if most of the indicators or even all come from a, from a joint intersectoral um, needs assessment. Now, while joint intersectoral needs assessment and, and household level data is quite important and should be also something that we all uh, continue to improve and contribute and ensure that protection is well reflected in this, it was also the view from many uh, of the clusters, including us, that the analysis of, of the whole framework, but particularly when you're in conditions, should also um, be using um, other sources, other assessment, not only household, but also area-based indicators. So this has also been now integrated better in the guidance and um, for this uh, last pillar, um, both area and household level indicators can be integrated. So concretely, what we have um, uh, recommended so, uh, I think someone is on mute, if you can mute, thanks. Uh, what we have um, worked together based on the on the lesson learned and also consultation uh, uh, and looking at the analysis you all conducted also last year is that um, there will be a first step in the JAF, which concretely we're talking about guidance for the JAF for the use of in the HPC for 2021. We'll have a first step which is consolidating and jointly analyzing across all actors, cluster sectors, agencies, experts, the context shocks and impacts of the crisis with a strong focus on protection risks and protection violations and protection um, threats um, that will help to establish the scope of the analysis. Um, as you may remember, um, in the HNO template, this is one of the, the first sections in the intersectoral narrative are precisely the analysis of the context, the shocks and impacts, and then there is a chapeau section which is set in the scope of the analysis, which will concretely is identifying what are the, the humanitarian profile that we are uh, prioritizing, what is the affected areas and what are the affected vulnerable groups. So this is the where we think that and we consider that protection will have a more central role and will have a concrete impact in terms of ensuring that areas mostly as, uh, or highly exposed to protection risk to protection violations and specific affected vulnerable groups are 
identify firstly are as priority for the analysis and more importantly obviously that analysis should it also be linked to the priorities for the response um it's also having an um, additional um, value added as as we uh, as we have um, been discussing with other colleagues and reflected also in the guidance it provides also a sequential linkage linkage between the non-humanitarian conditions pillars, these first three pillars of the analysis and the humanitarian conditions, and not maybe what happened or was reflected even in the in the guidance from last year, that kind of the analysis of context of the impact was separate from the analysis of humanitarian conditions, humanitarian needs, or there was not a clear link. Um, it will provide the baseline also for the calculation of people in need particularly, because the severity and uh, analysis intersectoral will give you percentages of where uh, uh, where needs, uh, particularly multiple needs uh, of the population are more severe than others that should be applied to the baseline figures of affected groups and to the affected areas. So this is something that this analysis will also establish the baseline. It also ensures, and this was all another key point that was lacking um, in our view, but also uh, among other clusters, um, um, the lack of joint analysis on your interpretation on the lack of focus on, on this through the whole JAF framework. The JAF framework was being more mostly approached from a technical complex uh, model that will allow to combine multiple uh, indicators and produce an average score, an average spin through uh, different mathematical formulas, but the joint analysis and your interpretation of the results was a bit lacking um, emphasis. So with this, from the beginning, all actors or clusters, AOR sectors are uh, jointly together interpreting first the context shocks and impacts to jointly decide uh, the scope of the analysis and the priority areas and groups. Um, and uh, it also uh, con builds upon the protection analysis that is normally part also of uh, HCT strategies. So it should be linked, but also it should be informed by that analysis. But it also provides a baseline for um, better linkages between humanitarian and development analysis. Um, you will probably have seen that recently um, there was um, a new guidance from ISC on collective outcomes between humanitarian and development actors. And in that guidance, one of the key first steps is to have a joint analysis of uh, risk, vulnerabilities, and context uh, of the situation between humanitarian and development actors that can help to identify what areas, what um, groups, what needs are more uh, related to humanitarian, what could be also be um, addressed through the nexus. So this will help to, to set up that baseline uh, and not only purely um, to start with the severity and intersectoral pin calculations. So concretely, what are the steps? Um, it's a very simple approach. We, try, we have also make sure that, that the approach is clear but um, simplified for all the operations. Um, the first step will be to identify and consolidate available information on the indicators that are specific for each context um, and aggregate them or disaggregate it to the different uh, geographical unit of analysis that um, is decided for each context. Then uh, to define context-based threshold or context-based um, um, options to analyze all these different indica indicators in consultation with the JAF, the IN working groups, but also clear uh, involvement from the clusters and AORs that are um, owners or contributing with these different indicators. This particularly will help to address one of the also challenges with the initial approach with the JAF, which is all the indicators uh, were hoping to have a universal threshold that was applied um, um, universally um, uh, across all operations, which makes sense when we are talking uh, about the humanitarian needs indicators, but it didn't make sense on the context indicators, which by definition will need to be adapted um, to the different um, scenarios and, and situations, and particular situations. Then there will be a joint session, joint sessions to jointly interpret these um, indicators 
and uh, the main outcome will be the consensus uh, among all actors of what are the most affected geographical areas by the crisis. And the final step will be to identify and profile the affected specific groups, uh, population groups in those areas. So for this, the idea will be to refer uh, to the humanitarian profile categories uh, as established in, in the global guidance, um, displaced, non-displaced, affected um, population, host, uh, non-host but affected, non-host not affected, but also dig down about the specific vulnerable groups uh, more affected by the drivers or the shocks that we are responding. So this will be a, a profile of, of those groups and establishing those baseline figures that will be then be the reference for the calculation of PIM figures. Finally, the um, severity analysis and PIM calculations um, the different um, um, sectors, clusters, and ERs will contribute with uh, specific indicators uh, related to humanitarian conditions, to humanitarian needs of the population, which again, not only, mostly, or um, in a large portion, will come from household level uh, assessment, household level um, data collection, but also equally important from area based um, or on secondary data sources. But the important is that they um, they have an associated threshold of severity that will be aggregated. The aggregation part is very uh, has had also one of the key areas of discussion within the JAF for many years, even not only months. For this year, there has been two different um, options that are being discussed and will be reflecting the guidance to have a simpler um, approach for this. This will be mostly the role of the GF team that will be set up in every operation. Um, but there is also, again, a quite important component of when the results of combining those indicators are uh, produced in terms of what are the severity scales of each area uh, and what are the calculation of people in need, the role of experts uh, and joint analysis interpretation will be, again, quite important. And finally, those estimation of people in need um, and severity will need also to be forecasted for the next year. Um, here, the framework and the guidance will recognize that this is an element that needs further development in, in the future, um, but uh, the guidance already includes um, some options and alternatives, particularly the use of, of a specific risk-based analysis to inform this uh, projection. So, um, concretely, from the role of um, different um, um, clusters and AORs colleagues in the field, will be as the same approach as last year, uh, start by assessing uh, uh, what are the information, the landscape, what is available, collect all the different indicators. In this case, one step will be that the context, uh, shocks, impact indicator will contribute to the first part of the analysis, while the specific humanitarian conditions indicators will contribute to the um, humanitarian conditions part. There will be a recommended and revised list of indicators for both the context uh, analysis and for the humanitarian conditions that will be shared with all operations. But obviously, they will need to be revised and probably adapted um, to each context. Uh, and for that, yeah, global um, the global team, both from the GPC and the AORs, will be uh, providing um, continuous support and uh, to guide you on that, that process. And then finally, um, discuss, validate with all the uh, actors and experts in the country on the uh, indicators selected uh, and uh, the information that will be contributed both to the um, context and the uh, humanitarian conditions intersectoral analysis. Lastly, just to finish soon and, uh, and open for questions and, uh, and comments, the sectoral analysis will not change much from what we have recommended last year. For us, um, the sectoral analysis will continue to feature uh, with the specific sectoral chapters. There is um, um, some considerations to ensure that 
both the intersectoral and the sectoral analysis are aligned, or there is also a discussion to avoid um, uh, the discrepancies. But concretely, uh, in our case, in the case of the protection um, sector and, and areas of responsibilities, the approach will be to, um, again, select the indicators that are, and information that is available. Some, or all of them, should have been fed into both the context and the humanitarian conditions part of the intersectoral approach, but others... Oh, Others could be um, added to this analysis if, yeah, were caught uh, or for some reasons didn't make it into the into the intersectoral analysis. And as last year, we will produce a joint severity analysis, both using overarching and specific indicators. So in our case, we will use all indicators to to come up with this overarching severity analysis of uh, by area and population groups. And then the PIN calculations will be linked to these scores and apply according to the categories of affected uh, and vulnerable groups. We will be providing and have been revising the, the different methodologies you used last year and will be providing some recommended uh, benchmarks to do this simpler link between the severity and the PIN calculations. Um, and uh, will be also supporting you in, the, in this implementation for HPC 2021. Two last points here is um, one key message is, uh, and we saw that happen uh, uh, last year, particularly because of the conclusions in the in the global intersectoral guidance. There shouldn't be too much time invested necessarily in mathematical calculations, in discussions back and forth on, on this. So I think. We have uh, tried and all the clusters uh, have also um, recommended to simplify the guidance and the approach for this year. Focus more on the qualitat qualitative analysis, the qualitative narrative of the key sections at the intersectoral and sectoral level, on the joint analysis and discussions with all the cluster and AOR constituencies uh, and experts. And particularly to highlight in the narrative what are the groups with the specific needs, what are the priority areas uh, that uh, are more affected by uh, protection, uh, risk violations, and other key um, sectoral shocks? I think that's one of the key messages we want to, to, to submit. But more or less, the severity analysis will be um, very similar to what we uh, established last year. Um, so, yeah, just to finish, um, I think we. Yeah, we are uh, focusing again on um, making sure that first um, there is as much use as secondary data available as possible. If considering the limitations for data collection, um, all the different indicators should be considered or the different available information should inform the analysis and there is a possibility to integrate now that into the framework. Um, and second, the most important is to focus on the narrative, on the making sure that the protection clusters, AORs in the field, have a lead role, an active role in the uh, the whole intersectoral analysis, particularly in the context-based one. Um, that will be led by the JAF team, by the um, uh, different configuration that that takes forms in the different countries. Um, so. I will finish here, just not to go over time. Um, surprisingly, today I seem to be on time, which I never am. So I will finish here and open for discussion, questions and clarifications. But um, let me also take the opportunity if uh, other colleagues from, from the upsell of, of the AOR want to, to add or, or, or complement anything I might have missed. Uh, if no, yeah, you know, other interventions from, from colleagues, open to questions, clarifications, 
uh, feedback um, on considerations you think are important for us to to bring into the finalization of the intersectoral and sectoral guidances for for this year please yeah go ahead and unmute yourself or raise your hand and i can uh, monitor here Okay, David, uh, welcome also, David, and thanks for, for the message. Is it all totally clear, very clear, as David says, or is just um, too much information, need to process it, or will uh, will benefit much from hearing from you or uh, hearing uh, also some questions or, or suggestions you may have? Thanks, Yvonne. That was clear even for me. So thank you. Thanks, William. Um, That was very clear from um, for me too from the AOR. I guess it's very Thanks, clear Salah. now. And I, I think questions can come later <laughs> when we get really into the to the work. Thanks a lot, uh, Astrid. I believe it was right. Um, thanks. Yes, You're seeing here. Um, yeah, Jax. Thanks. Thanks for. Uh, for the comment um, about yeah the the importance uh, that last year um, had the dedicated I in support particularly during, during the HNO and uh, HPC process um, and um, yeah of possibilities of, of continuing that this year so for sure that's also yeah part of the of one of the key messages also that we wanted to give also at the at the end of, um, as closing uh, remarks today but indeed um, we are planning to support um, collectively as global protection cluster and, and areas of responsibilities um, uh, and all the um, focal points both for um, yeah, field support HPC and, and IM to support all of you um, as required um, but also um, support you not only yeah, well, remotely, probably, but ideally also uh, at field level if COVID uh, allows, COVID situation allows, but also with um, support, uh, with advocacy or clarifications uh, uh, with other clusters, with OCH, et cetera, on the implementation of this analysis. There's also, just to mention, uh, just to complement this, because the JAF, the idea is that it was first finalized back even last year or the beginning of this year. It was then piloted in a few operations and then went on through a process of review, validation, before actually making it into the HPC. But that has not happened due to different circumstances, the delays in the discussion, but also the, obviously the, the COVID situation. So the JAF is being finalized now, the guidance, the indicators, but is kind of being will be, be piloted now during the whole um, uh, HPC process. So it has been um, also agreed across all the key actors behind the job, the global clusters, agencies, um, OCHA, and, and also donors are supporting this to have a dedicated cell at the global level across key uh, experts from the clusters and agencies to support the implementation in the in the field this year. Um, so that will be also something, not only the support you will get obviously dedicated from the cluster in the URs, but also this global level 
um, let's call it sale or, or help desk that will be um, dedicated to this. Um, just looking here at the comments, please colleagues feel free to jump in or unmute while I read this if you have any specific question. Uh, Sylvia, um, there seems to be a prioritization of the other conditions, well-being and the standards of living, at least from our side, miscoping mechanism indicators. Thanks, Sylvia. Yes, uh, indeed, this was one of the confusions um, from last year because there was this guidance that was shared to the field um, on pin calculation, intersector pin calculations, and because the framework was not finalized, the option that was put forward uh, for operations was that each subpillar should have its own calculation of pin, and then the well-being, physical, mental well-being should have priority because it's considered to have the indicators more related to acute needs, urgent needs, uh, second living standards, then coping and, and protection, but usually in most cases were only the, the first two which created a lot of confusions and it was not the whole the purpose of the framework from the start. So that's why this year there has been an agreement and it will be uh, like that in the framework that there shouldn't be a calculation by subfiller. First of all, all indicators contribute to the analysis and to the uh, of severity of needs and pit calculation. There is some discussions and we will follow up and provide a specific guidance as required. Some suggestions that are yet, that, that's the pending part of the guidance um, to be finalized over the next couple of weeks on uh, having some critical indicators in the framework that will be decided in each context, in each operation, um, because in some cases uh, combining so much in so many indicators will be, will might invisibilize or deprioritize some critical needs or critical concerns. So that is something that is being considered, but only at that level. So I hope that clarified your question, Sylvia, but please feel free to, to mention it or to complement in the chat or, or, or orally. Um, to one question about the step two. The step one is identifying consolidated available information, so can I explain the step two more? Let me go back. So this is the steps for, I mean, it's pretty much similar steps. This will be uh, that those indicators that go into context shocks and impacts will need to have some, some um, analysis options, some thresholds or ranking, which could depend on, on the indicators. Some indicators will be about areas of areas um, with humanitarian access issues or constraints. So usually this will be a yes or no type of indicators. Others will be um, conflict incidents um, uh, at the geographical level or the community level. So this could have um, some type of thresholds or analysis from most to least affected uh, areas. So for each of these, uh, the different indicators, because they combine so different type of many different type of indicators, um, they will uh, they will be contextualized uh, for the joint analysis and then to compare across all the available indicators and see what are the most affected areas and, and affected groups. So this is something also that um, from the global level we, we are happy to, to support. But hope that answered your question, Javibat. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Uh, I wanted to go back before Mary Emily. I don't know if you're still with us. Um, yes, I see you. Uh, yeah. on, uh, on the question you were having uh, in the first session about the yeah, protection consequence, I don't know if now it's um, also more clear or if you still have questions uh, about it. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Yes, it's it's much clearer, and uh, and uh, we've uh, we've been using uh, the protection consequence last year in in Mali, in addition to number one and number two on living standards and well-being. Uh, but I, I, we will see how um, how we make the shift 
uh, to um, um, yeah to follow the the guidance that you just explained. Uh, it does it does make sense. Um, I just uh, yeah just need to see how how we uh, how we can uh, include the changes uh, from the methodology that we were using uh, last year. Great. We don't expect, but obviously uh, we'll need to 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 see how the implementation goes and support you on that uh, for sure. That this will create. Um, a change, considerable change in the type of information uh, to collect and to analyze pretty much uh, for the intersectoral part. We're um, still taking as baseline the key context or overarching indicators that we were using last year um, terminology to contribute to that analysis and then the specific available indicators at the um, um, humanitarian needs or uh, conditions level. Um, for our analysis, they will all um, contribute to the overarching um, severity scale and then um, be the basis for pin calculations. For the intersectoral framework, will uh, will contribute to the different components of it. Um, now, when it comes to the, I think also your question was related also how this translates into the, the HRP. So again, this for this year, um, one of the simplifications because we also understand there was a lot of challenges on that last year that once you have the pin per pillar and then uh, there was an expectation to have also targets associated to each of the pins, um, but then because living standards and physical mental will be well being prioritized, if we had our protection separate pin which will be attached to a specific targets, and funding, then that will be, be creating um, either overlaps or either uh, deprioritization of protection uh, against the other two pillars. So this time, the idea is that the, the analysis produces identify the priority areas, groups, and the main severity uh, and, uh, and pin calculations that should inform the prioritization of the HRP. But uh, in the HRP, the the Again, there will be no need to link uh, targets or funding to now a specific pin for subpillars. That being said, for the strategic objectives, this should continue to be both ensuring again also the centrality of protection, so addressing also the key drivers, protection, violations, and risk the population, as well as the key um, humanitarian needs of the population. So yeah, hopefully. Um, shouldn't um, have, uh, on the contrary, hopefully should simplify the, the overall approach for this year, but we're, um, yeah, we'll be following up on that and, and providing support. Um, any other questions, comments, colleagues? Ivan, this is Boris, how are you? Do you hear me well? Boris, yes. <laughs> yeah, <yes>. Sorry, <laughs> and uh, hello to everyone from somewhere between Serbia and Croatia and about to, to cross the border, but I stopped just to, to make a couple of remarks. And uh, this is for uh, all the, the protection cluster coordinators and, uh, and IMOs, but also to all the AOR coordinators and IMOs, because just a couple of uh, key points no, to, to add about the process that we have been developing since the beginning of uh, this year, very hardly uh, sometimes, but uh, in an incredible team spirit. The first point, it will be that uh, never before, and thanks to the efforts of all the global AORs and global protection cluster colleagues, protection has been better positioned for having a more evidence-based analysis into the HNO. And at the same time, this has been possible because, in my personal opinion, never before the protection cluster, the global protection cluster and the global AORs, they have been able to work as together and synchronize as uh, it has happened this year. So more than anything else, this message is for encouraging the, the colleagues in the field to feel confident and calm because uh, there is not only an evidence base a methodology and approach that is going to enhance the centrality uh, of protection and thus the, the protection analysis, but also there is a full team from all the different AORs behind that uh, sometimes informally call it the, this support cell that together with operation cells from the global protection cluster will be supporting and accompanying the, the colleagues over uh, this process. We all know that the, the coming months they are going to be intense in HNOs, but um, 
let me finish with this uh, very quick comment, which is that uh, this morning when Ivan said with me the presentation for making some comments and the last review, uh, I only made two. One uh, and one of them, it was to highlight in black, not to get worried about the mathematics of the pin calculations, but to focus on the joint analysis. And now we have the opportunity and I'm pretty sure that uh, a very good perspective and um, yeah, ambition, but also very good perspective for the results of this year. Over to you and thank you to, to you in particular, Ivan, and the rest of colleagues that they have been contributing in, in this process. It has been a fantastic experience. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boris. And uh, yes, I think um, also the, the opportunity to, to thank all the, the colleagues um, um, from uh, yeah, the OPSELS and ARs that um, yeah, have been contributing, but also to colleagues in the field um, that, yeah, based on the experiences you have shared with, with us, the methodologies, the challenges from last year, um, yeah, have been uh, able to, to take a more um, a strategic and uh, effective approach within the job for this year. Um, so, last round of options for comments, questions, suggestions, complaints. Um, otherwise, I'll um, yeah, turn back to um, the global coordinators again for a uh, wrap up. Thank you very much, Ivan, uh, for this uh, clear uh, messaging. I believe now Jim will make a first round of wrap up, followed by Astrid uh, to close the session. Jim, over to you. Thank you, William. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, colleagues. And um, firstly, just wanted to introduce myself. I might not have met all of you yet. I'm Jim Robinson. I started with the HLP um, AOR as coordinator in June. So um, yes, it's very good to meet you. Very good to be here. Um, I just wanted to offer just a couple of wrap up sort of comments on some of the discussion we had just so that we don't lose those things that we talked about earlier. Um, so um, I mean, Ivan's revisited uh, some of the um, discussion around uh, using the consequences and how we calculate the pin, but um, so I won't revisit that just now, but just to say that uh, the comment was made and heard um, to to have the webinars in French um, and it was agreed that uh, the GPC would follow up on that. So that's something just to note. Um, also, we discussed the um, monitoring and financial tracking, particularly when we're thinking about integrated programming, you know, this growing trend that we want to see more of, that it's uh, really important to be able to then track, report and monitor what's happening with that. Um, and as Ivan and colleagues responded, you know, there's an ongoing discussion with OCHA on that to allow tracking by AOR and, and uh, uh, the Global Protection Cluster will, will keep following up on with that and uh, bring you news as that develops. Um, also talked just to, about the, some of the challenges around around budget and funding and financing, you know, having to support and defend the sectoral chapters and we'd have to refer back to past years and just acknowledging that um, the potential vicious cycle of that, that um, when we look back to the previous funding, it can then be a sort of a, a fake ceiling, a, a limit on what's gone before. So um, something we were talking about was really um, ways to advocate for for um, putting partners and capacity and, and seeing those things increase. And Michael gave the example of um, DRC where they were able to put donors and partners together on a global call and then sort of think about how to increase the capacity. So that was something that was, um, yeah, just shared and, and hopefully a useful thing. Um, just on the second round of discussion, most of which you've just heard, but just to make the point again that um, about the IM support on the HNO and HPC process and, and just the, the, the hope that that's, you know, that there'll be enough that available for you that the cluster is going to be providing that um, through the AOR, through the GPC team, through the OPSEL. We're going to be there to support support the uh, the work that you're all doing. Um, 
And yeah, I just wanted to finish to just have give a first round, just recapping some of the key messages from today, just as as, as we leave the session. So, so we started off talking about the greater focus on integrated protection analysis and enhanced response planning. You know, focusing on ensuring the centrality of, of protection and inclusivity, ensuring that protection risks inform the overall collective analysis. So not just through the protection indicators, but also through the expert inputs into the collective analysis exercises, and as well as is ensuring the AOR specific sections in the HNOs and HRPs, we, we need to enhance further visibility to other key protection areas. So protection of civilians, anti-trafficking, uh, mental health and psychosocial support to protection of older persons. And we heard in more detail about the importance of considering and advocating for the inclusion of, of those with disabilities in HNO and HRPs. Um, we heard about that being a shared factor of identity across groups requiring protection for example, women, children and older people, and also some statistics of uh, there being higher incidence of, of disability in conflict affected uh, situations. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind. Another key message that we heard about was um, the integrated programming. So that needs to spearhead our engagement with other sectors towards this collective protection outcomes. And as we promote integrating and joint programming with protection actors, so we to engage in early discussions with other clusters, look for opportunities to, to, to work together and to program jointly. Um, and the third thing I just wanted to sort of leave us with just to re-enhance is just this you know, to focus on this comprehensive response planning with the targets and requirements on our operational footprint and that there will be further guidance to be developed and disseminated by the GPC. So talked about an additional um, webinar and dedicated regional events. And of course, we've got the Global Protection Forum annual retreat coming up in September. So there will be other other events on there that we hope to see you at. Um, yeah, and that's um, by way of my comments and uh, and sort of remind us on, on the messages and just hand over now to Astrid for any further comments on what we've discussed today and, and some further closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess, first of all, I'd like to echo what Boris was saying as well, just to, from our point of view, from the GBVAOR, I, I haven't looked in detail um, from all uh, perspectives, but what we've seen in our analysis is a great, great leap forward in terms of quality and attention to um, to the quality of the needs assessments and, and how we, in a way, integrate GBV, not just in our own sections, finally having our own sections, but across. So I think it's true in terms of um, the new templates and all the energy that has gone into um, really improving and making a, a real use of these strategic planning processes. It's a real, um, I guess, it's a, uh, I just want to congratulate everyone who's here today because I think there's a lot going on. There's a lot of discussions and a lot to learn for many of us. And I think it is important to also realize that already last year, a lot of energy went in and it did make a big difference. I think that's also important because sometimes we might feel that um, that's how I feel, at least sitting in Geneva, that HNO and HRP season seems to just sort of start and end and start and end. And it's 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 a big, big part of what we do in the end. So uh, a big thank you there. And, and just wanted to, to to share that sort of uplifting message. Then in terms of the other closing remarks, yes, um, we'd. We do need to still work on enhancing and harmonizing our results frameworks. Um, and how we work on response monitoring systems as well to demonstrate the quality and protection outcomes of uh, our field protection responses. I think um, overall the, the response monitoring is, is maybe one of the areas, at least from our uh, colleagues in the GPAOR, we, I do recognize there's a lot to be done still. So we will be working on guidance for harmonizing um, the response monitoring and, and uh, look forward to, to sharing more of that in the next months. Um, we will also be developing guidance to enhance targeting and estimation and financial requirements, the costing, um, which of course is, is also a big issue between where we have the activity costing and where we have the more um, 
traditional projects-based costing. And we will be providing support to, um, yeah, at, together as a team. I think that's also a key message and a key change maybe of the last year is that we have in, um, in the GPC with the AORs, we have a dedicated field support and we've been better at working together so that when, uh, when we've had field missions, we're able to cover more ground and talk not just to our own colleagues, but more broadly within the protection. And I think we'll, con we've, we'll continue doing that as much with the remote support, maybe realistically realizing there will be more technical remote uh, support than in country this season. Um, the positive, of course, with remote support is that we can also provide in real time technical advice. Um, so we have a dedicated team to provide this support. Um, from the GBVAOR, um, we're also re uh, relieved because uh, while we're still hiring at the global level, we, we have more or less candidates ready to start working in regional IM positions, supporting the subclusters at the regional level and uh, hopefully engaging with all of you, not just with the uh, GBV, of course. Um, so those colleagues are starting in, in August. So together we should have quite a lot of capacity to support and for you guys to push us as well so that we learn and we become better at supporting you and providing the guidance you need. I think it's a two-way uh, collaboration. And we also uh, stand ready and I think that's important for uh, that you remember when things are a bit difficult uh, when you get into discussions that are more political, when, um, yeah, when things, when you, you hit your head against the wall and it's not because of the technical <laughs> parts, but more political, that we are also ready in, in the GPC uh, with the AORs to provide global advocacy with OCHA, uh, other clusters, lead agencies and donors. Um, We've done that recently on the FDS, and I think, um, yeah, I think it's important that you all feel confident to either reach out together or separately, and that you know that in Geneva there's a team where we collaborate well um, and we know each other quite well. So, if there are issues either between protection colleagues or with others where guidance is not uh, implemented, um, solutions are not found, we are also here to try to help within our means, of course. But uh, that's also a role we're happy to play. So with that, I think this is almost historic, right? If we can finish before time, um, I thank you all for your attention. I think it's been a very uh, good session, um, at least for me, I hope for you too. And with all the um, webinars coming up through the, you know, replacing our annual face-to-face -face meetings, um, this is only one out of many learning opportunities. And I think it's good that together as a community, we, we start the embark on the HPC together. So with that, I would like to say thank you so much. Thank you a million times to Ivan as well for guiding us through all of this. And uh, yes, have a good evening or morning, wherever you are. Thank you so much. Over to you, William. Nothing to add. Thank you all. Have a great morning, afternoon and evening. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>